Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. I'm Anand Swami Nathan. And I'm Jenny Beck Esme. All right, Jenny, what are we going to tackle today? Well, so I wanted to tackle this topic that I've actually only seen one in practice, but I was just in constant terror of as a medical student and as an intern when I was learning to place IVs and start lines, and that is the air embolism. I was convinced that I was going to be able to cause this and just kill somebody. Well, this is a good one. I think there's a lot of confusion over the air embolism and how much and what they are going to present with and what to do. So I think it's a great topic for us to take on. Now, the air embolism is an entrapment of air in the venous or arterial system as a result of direct communication and a pressure gradient. Air can enter the venous system through traumatic injuries and some surgical procedures, but the thing that usually gets us as ED docs nervous, the thing that makes us think, oh, I got to really watch out for the air embolism, is placement of a central venous catheter or an IV. This is something we all dread and fear, but I'm not sure how common it actually is. Well, the data, you know, obviously isn't great. On anything that's kind of rare, it's hard to get great data. It seems like central lines are the most common source in ED patients, but the incidence ranges from 1 in 40 to 1 in 3,000. So that's a pretty big spread. As far as peripheral lines go, we, again, don't really know. There was this one study looking at peripheral IVs placed in the upper extremities of patients undergoing non-contrast CTs, and they looked at these patients and They had about 208, I think it was 208 patients, and they found small, clinically insignificant air emboli in 4.8% of them. What does that mean? I don't know. And that brings us back to what it means to have a clinically significant air embolism. In a dog model study back in the 70s, they found that 0.5 mLs per kilo per minute led to cardiorespiratory failure. But Jenny, you know, you and I aren't dogs, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of air. That's a lot of air that you're getting in there. Yeah. Um, There are some recent papers on humans that show that somewhere in the 200 to 500 mLs of air introduced at a rate of 100 mLs per second was acutely fatal, and that's about 3 to 5 mLs per kilo, but other estimates suggest that it could be as low as 50 mLs. So maybe 50 is the point where it can be dangerous, which is all to say, we don't really know. Yeah, we don't know. So what exactly is is the issue here? Venous air can travel from the right heart into the pulmonary system, diffuse across the arteriolar wall, and into the alveolar space. Small amounts of air can be removed by diffusion this way, but we think that gas exceeding 50 mLs or more can lead to obstruction of the pulmonary outflow tract. Large bubbles can cause decreased flow from the right heart, and smaller bubbles can become wedged within pulmonary arterioles, microcirculation, and coronary vessels. These little bubbles can inhibit forward flow of blood and cause vasoconstriction and tissue ischemia. These patients could have a number of presentations depending on where the air embolism ends up. So we have to think about it like a blood clot. They could have dizziness, syncope, chest pain, dyspnea, and of course, for the quite significant embolism, they could have otherwise unexplained hypotension or hemodynamic collapse. Basically, what we're seeing in the severe cases is obstructive shock. So when should you worry about an air embolism? Obviously, a patient with significant blunt or penetrating trauma who has concerning symptoms or hemodynamic collapse, you're going to be getting a pretty significant workup on and hopefully you discover this. Additionally, if you have a patient who suddenly develops new symptoms or becomes unstable or develops new ischemic symptoms after a line placement, you should probably consider this in your differential diagnosis. In the trauma patient with shock, hemorrhage, tension pneumo, and tamponade are going to be things that we should focus on first, depending on the type of trauma. But when you can't find a cause, air embolism is something to consider. If you're worried about an air embolism, you're going to want to get a CT scan. Get chest if you're worried about pulmonary venous embolism, head for stroke symptoms, abdomen, pelvis if you're worried about ischemia to the gut. Additionally, you may want to add a TTE or a TEE if intracardiac air is suspected. Keep in mind the numbers of these patients are low, so these recommendations are really based on expert opinion, not rigorous studies. Treatment of these patients is going to include high flow, 100% oxygen, and moving the patient into the left lateral decubitus position and the Trendelenburg position if they're hemodynamically unstable. And what that does by moving them into that position is it gets the air, if it's in the heart, to kind of come back up into the right atrium, which actually might be a position where you could aspirate it if you happen to have a central line in. You're going to go ahead with your usual resuscitation methods if the patient has become unstable. So give some IV fluids. You might want to give inotropes and vasopressors for hemodynamic support. And if they have a complete collapse, CPR may be indicated. 
there are some case reports of doctors aspirating air from the right ventricle through a CVL or a PA catheter, like Swami said. So this could be considered if you have a really crashing patient, but it's probably not something you're going to start a line to do. So if the CVL is in place, then you might be able to aspirate that air out. Additionally, in a totally crashing patient, you should consider emergent cardiopulmonary bypass. These are always tricky, Jenny, because we see so few of these cases, it's hard to have real recommendations. But again, going back to that aspiration, if you just put in an upper central line, so something in the subclavian or the IJ and the patient has hemodynamic collapse, then trying to aspirate air back may be reasonable if you think air embolism is there. There's a lot of ifs in that sentence, right? So yeah. it makes it very difficult for us to know if this is what's indicated. But you're right. I would not place a central line to try and aspirate an embolism that may or may not be present unless you got an echo that's showing it. Right. Yeah. Now, lastly, hyperbaric oxygen could be considered in patients with hemodynamic compromise, neurologic deficits, or end organ damage. For this to be effective, it seems like you got to start it pretty quick. You're going to want to dive the patient within four to six hours of the onset of symptoms. The evidence for this is from small retrospective case series. In one of these retrospective cohort studies of about 86 patients with air embolism, patients treated with hyperbaric oxygen within six hours of presentation were more likely to recover than those who had hyperbarics after six hours, 68% versus 40%. Now, probably that's compelling enough to consider in a sick patient, especially if you can get them to hyperbarics quick, which is not always available. We don't have hyperbarics in our place. We've got to transfer them up the street or you know, into a different borough to get that done. And regardless, if a sick patient like this, you're probably going to need a surgical consultation and perhaps your local hyperbaric chamber is going to want to get on the line to discuss. While we've been talking about iatrogenic air embolisms or embolisms from trauma, we should also probably just mention the one other cause of these gas embolisms that comes up, not so much where you and I work, but where some of our listeners probably work and certainly on the boards, is the gas embolism from pulmonary barotrauma during ascent while scuba diving. In that case, expanding gas ruptures the alveoli, air enters the pulmonary venous circulation and then into the heart and the systemic circulation, and from there can cause all sorts of obstruction like we've been talking about. Well, you're fresh off the board, so we know that that is something that comes up pretty often on the boards and, well, not so often in real life. We don't have a lot of scuba divers where I am and definitely not going down to those depths and then having rapid ascension, but something to consider if you work in those kind of locations and, again, if you're sitting for the boards. That kind of embolism can present with cardiac arrest, an MI, CVA, seizure, or altered mental status. In general, the symptoms for that are going to be rapid onset after ascent and should be treated with O2, placing the patient in that supine position, IV fluids to increase perfusion, and then rapidly getting them to hyperbarics. All right, Jenny, how about some take-home points to wrap it up? Absolutely. First, air embolism is a rare but potentially fatal complication of central line placement and some surgical procedures, and of course, as a result of barotrauma. Second, Recognizing the signs and symptoms of air embolism can be really tricky because it can look like any other ischemic process. So consider air embolism if you have a patient that rapidly decompensates after you place a central line, the most likely culprit for those of us in the ED. And then last, treatment should focus on supportive cares. Give supplemental oxygen, IV fluids and hemodynamic support, and consider hyperbarics and cardiopulmonary bypass for the super sick patient. That's all for the Corium podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreyam.net. We've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks and see you all next week. <laughs>